Good morning. Good morning. My name is Councilmember Idenick Miller, and I am the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's hearing on Introduction 888 and Introduction 901. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues who are present, Councilmember Adams and Councilmember Ben Kalos. Today, the committee will hear two pieces of legislation. Introduction 888, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, is a local law that would establish a retirement savings program for private sector employees. <coughs> now, I will turn the mic over to Councilmember Kalos uh, to speak on 888. Thank you to uh, Civil Service and Labor Chair Idenink Miller for his leadership on this legislation, this issue. And as a labor leader generally, I'm council member Ben Kalos. Every New Yorker should be able to save for retirement. The big problem is that more than half of working age New Yorkers don't have access through their employers to any retirement plan. 641,000 New York households nearing retirement have less than $12,000 in retirement savings. Our nation is facing a retirement deficit of $14 trillion, which is the difference between what people need to retire and what they've saved. <coughs> I had the misfortune to work as an associate on the Delphi bankruptcy at Gorla Kravitz and List House as we represented the International Union of Operating Engineers. Delphi was spun off from General Motors uh, so that they could declare the largest bankruptcy in American history at the time. Somehow a person could work their entire lives for an automaker who somehow couldn't afford to pay their retirement. Meanwhile, they had millions to pay their executives and still more millions to give them golden parachutes after they ran their companies into the ground, it was clear to me that the laws were broken and that those lawmakers who made them were broken. It's actually what inspired me for my current public service. Working with Bill Samuels, I administered pension plans for two companies when we realized why so few employers offered these plans. We began advocating for private participation in public pensions in 2012, working with SEIU and at the time a gentleman named John Adler through an organization called Effective New York. In early 2015, then public advocate Tish James and civil service and labor chair Idenique Miller proposed and heard introduction 692 to study a public retirement plan for private sector workers. By the fall of 2015 and 2016, I worked with Mayor de Blasio, James, and Miller to advocate with the White House and through the rulemaking process around new rules promulgated by the Employee Benefits Security Administration of the Department of Labor that resulted in guidance on how states and cities could establish retirement programs for the private sector workers. In May 2017, President Trump signed a joint resolution rolling back the Obama-era regulations that encouraged states to set up auto IRAs. But to be clear, uh, and this is just a lesson on executive authority for the President and the Majority Leader of the Senate, executive orders and regulations cannot overturn federal laws. And following federal guidance that has been overturned doesn't mean following that advice is illegal. So far, 10 states and one city have enacted government-sponsored retirement programs for private sector workers. In April of 2018, legislation long carried by Assemblymember Robert Rodriguez in the budget as the New York State Secure Choice Savings Program was adopted as a voluntary Roth IRA. A voluntary option is great, but auto enrollment improves vastly upon voluntary participation. Oregon Saves launched in the first in the nation auto IRA. Uh, their program is incredibly successful. I hope to hear from them today. The legislation I've reintroduced the Civil Service and Labor Chair Idenique Miller will do the following. It will auto-enroll employees, uh, man, uh, would be mandatory through a payroll deduction for employers with 10 or more employees who have not offered a retirement savings plan for the past, past two years. Employees over the age of 21 who worked more than 20 hours a week would be auto-enrolled with a default contribution rate of 3% of their annual income. Smaller employers who have not offered an independent and independent contractors who do not have access to remind savings would also be able to join retirement security for alls. Employers would not contribute to the plan and there will be no cost to employers. I'd like to thank Committee Chair Idenique Miller for being a forefront with me on this issue, Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, staff uh, Malcolm Bluthorn, as well as many other staff from the City Council, and the Mayor for making this a part of his platform since 2016. Thank you. Okay, AARP, you're here enough to know that <laughs> this is what we do. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Councilmember Kalos, for reminding me 
um, this journey that we've been on for, for uh, a number of years now that has culminated with today's hearing. Um, the second bill, introduction number 901, sponsored by myself, is a local law that would establish a retirement savings board to oversee retirement savings program of private sector employees that would be created by intro 888. These two bills come at a time when there's approximately 4 million private sector jobs in New York City, but a large number of the private sector employees who lack retirement coverage. Particularly striking is that in 2016, 33% of the city's private sector workers aged 25 to 64 years of age in the workplace re retirement had no work, to, uh, participated in workplace retirement, which is down from uh, nearly 40%, so we have decreased uh, the number of folks saving by 7% in just three years. Imagine the demise, that the track that we are on now. With such a small number of workers being provided workplace retirement plans, many New Yorkers lack financial stability. As a result, they face increased risk of lower standards of living, poverty, once they retire. In the efforts to ensure that workers have the financial stability in retirement, individual retirement accounts, also known as IRAs, have presented an alternative option for workers to begin savings for their retirement. Introduction 888 and 901 would create such a program for private sector employees in New York City, while also creating a board that would ensure the proper and successful implementation of this program. Beyond these two bills, I would like to forward look forward to a broader conversation about retirement savings itself. Too many people leave the conversa leave conversation about their own retirement to future dates. And before you know it, we're facing that future. And retirement is here. And what happens as a result that we see so many folks that are, no that are here and are just not prepared for the quality of life that they so richly deserve and are dependent on government help to meet their very basic needs just to afford the quality of life. With rapid aging, rapidly aging population, this is a timely and important conversation to have and one which I hope to lead into greater conversations about a city's retirement plan and security for all. The committee looks forward to hearing from the administration on these efforts and from advocates on the work that they have done to this, in this critically important area. And before turning the, the mic over um, to the first panel, I'd like to thank my staff, Chief of Staff, Ali Rasulina Jad, Brandon Clark, Senior Advisor Joe Goldblum. We'd also like uh, to thank committee counsel and central staff for their efforts, uh, Malcolm, Kevin, Kendall, and finally I want to welcome Nuzak as our new committee counsel. She also uh, chaired the uh, Committee on the Aging previously, so um, is very much familiar with the needs and the values of our aging population and look forward to working with her on this issue. We are now going to swear in our first panel witness. Uh, if you could raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer council member questions truthfully? Yes. Okay, if you could just hit the mic and you can begin. Yes. Before uh, Mr. Adler begins, we, we've been joined by council member Andy King. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller, uh, for conducting this hearing on this critical subject. My name is John Adler. I'm Director of the Mayor's Office of Pensions and Investments and Chief Pension Investment Advisor for Mayor Bill de Blasio. I'm here to testify on behalf of the de Blasio administration regarding the private sector retirement legislation being considered today. Mayor de Blasio appointed me to my current position in 2015. In that, capa in that capacity, I serve as the Mayor's representative on the boards of the New York City Pension Funds and the Deferred Compensation Plan. I am chair of the NICERS board and facilitator of the common investment meeting for the five New York City retirement systems. Since 2011, when I became the retirement security campaign director for SEIU, through today in my current role, a main focus of my work has been seeking to address 
the slow motion retirement security crisis in this country by seeking to create retirement programs for the roughly half of the American workforce who have no retirement plan at work. I was one of the co-founders of the Center for Retirement Initiatives at Georgetown University. I co-convened a national retirement security for all coalition in Washington, and I served on the board of the National Public Pension Coalition, which works to protect defined benefit pensions for public employees around the country. My testimony today is thus informed by my experience in the research, design, and launch of programs like the one proposed here and seeing those programs start to finally help turn the ship for the millions of workers whose current retirement plan is nothing more than work forever. Let me explain specifically the need for this program in the city of New York. The challenges of maintaining a decent standard of living in retirement begin with a lack of access to viable savings programs. 40% of New Yorkers near retirement age have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. The challenges are particularly pronounced among lower income Im immigrant and minority communities and among women. According to the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School, out of approximately 3.5 million private sector workers in New York, only 41% have access to an employer-sponsored retirement plan, which is down from 49% only a decade ago. The problem, therefore, is getting worse. The administration supports intros 888 and 901, which establish a mandatory auto-enrollment payroll deduction IRA program for employees of New York City private sector employers that do not offer a retirement plan. At any time, an employer may choose to offer its own retirement plan and discontinue participation in the city plan. We estimate that over a million workers will be eligible for the program this legislation would establish. There are no employer contributions in order to remain in compliance with federal ERISA regulations. The proposal we are considering here in New York City is very similar to programs that are already operating in California, Illinois, and Oregon, where nine million workers who did not have access to a workplace retirement plan two years ago now do. Programs have also passed but not yet opened in Maryland, Connecticut, and New Jersey. And at least 19 other states are studying or considering similar plans. If enacted, this program will help over a million New York City workers and millions more in the future save for their own retirements through payroll deductions on the job. This program has the potential to significantly reduce future poverty among retirees in New York City and take an important step towards helping over a million New Yorkers maintain or improve their standard of living when they stop working. As a 2018 report from the Pew Retirement Savings Project shows, the savings workers will achieve will have an impact far beyond the absolute dollars saved by giving workers options as they near retirement. An especially significant value add for many workers is the chance to boost lifetime retirement income by delaying taking Social Security. Every year that a worker waits to begin taking Social Security adds 8% to his or her monthly check from ages 66 to 70 and 6% from ages 62 to 66. So even if workers begin saving relatively late in their careers, if those savings allow a delay in taking Social Security even for a year or two, that will mean a substantial boost to their monthly income for the rest of their life. In closing, the creation of this program will help many New Yorkers begin saving for their own retirement for the first time. It represents a major step forward to address this crisis by ensuring that virtually all New Yorkers can save for their retirement through payroll deductions, the most effective way to build retirement savings. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Farrah Lewis. So let's, let's begin by talking about 
implementation and kind of what the program is would, would actually look like and whether or not the city has capacity and capabilities of of managing this and and um, from from a, a tracking and uh, participation standpoint um, what would that look like let's, let's look at its its infant stages and what are absolutely necessary for um, for this plan to be up and running and what would make it solvent Sure, thank you for that question, uh, Chairman. The um, idea, the, the plan, would be that a board uh, would be appointed by the mayor, and then the board would uh, uh, conduct requests for proposals, most likely, to uh, contract with vendors experienced in the administration of programs like this, as well as investment managers, professional investment managers, uh, with a menu of simple, low-cost investment options for workers to choose. Uh, the third-party administrator would then be uh, charged with implementing and executing the program on a on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, primarily through a web portal, web-based portal, that employers and employees would access in order to uh, enroll and uh, make the decisions associated with being in the program. So, um, based on your experience and, and, and my little bit of experience as a, a as a trustee as well, sure. Um, on the labor side, um, not a lot of folks and 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 uh, organizations around have um, the capacity to to manage what we envision this to be. Um, um, that being said, uh, and the enrollment of uh, potentially millions of, of employees um, and, and managing uh, the changes in employment and, and benefits and, and so forth, uh, that, that's kind of where, where, where the board would, would, would step in and, and, and just ensure that we have qualified vendors that, that are doing that. But from your background and understanding, um, Certainly, we'll have no problem in attracting those folks, but are there those capable and qualified folks out there and, and ready to perform this task? Yes, there are capable, qualified uh, organizations out there, uh, including those that are servicing the um, existing uh, uh, states and uh, operations that are in place now. Uh, and I think that the size of New York City uh, would mean that we would get uh, a, 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 a good number of interested uh, organizations, and we would be able to select an organization that's both experienced, highly qualified, and also would offer uh, a, a very good price. You know, part of the idea here is that uh, the economies of scale of doing something like this in a place like New York City would enable us to have very attractive fees so that the employees would pay very, very little uh, for their um, for the program uh, to function for them. And could we talk about setup uh, cost? And obviously, if we look at uh, throughout the country, uh, and and the cost of establishing such a program had varied, but somewhere like Illinois, uh, cost approximately fifteen to twenty, and and a million. And startup costs, but what we're estimating here, um, and 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 uh, what it would cost the city of New York, uh, significantly more. Did you talk about that? Well, I don't think it's going to cost significantly more than it has cost in other states where they're doing it throughout an entire state, uh, and we're just doing it in a city that's you know fairly compact, even though we're a big city. Um, so we don't we we do not know exactly how much it's going to cost yet. We will work through uh, with uh, OMB uh, the regular budgeting process uh, to determine what the cost will be. Um, but you know we don't think it will cost uh, any more than it has cost in other uh, states. I don't think I, I'm not sure about that number for Illinois. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not my understanding of the costs in the states that have been up and running so far. 
So, and, and then those, those smaller states, certainly when you compare the density, uh, New York City is, is, is pretty comparable, if, if not greater than those as well. Um, New York State has a voluntary plan. What is different and why, why not wait to see where they are and whether the, the successes and, and, and kind of look at best practices and if whether or not this is act, actually necessary um, to get this up and running. I certainly have my thoughts, but you know, sure. like to hear from the experts over there. Um, thank you. Um, that's a very good question. Why do this now when New York State has a voluntary program? So the New York State program, which was passed last year in the 2018 session, is voluntary for employers and voluntary for employees. Uh, so it doesn't, uh, we, w our belief is that it really doesn't, uh, will not because it hasn't yet been implemented and the state has not taken any uh, visible steps to implement it yet, but we don't believe it will effectively expand coverage uh, to those uh, that are underserved or, or frankly are not served now, and that's really the goal. So, um, you know, we don't think that we should be waiting for the whims of Albany uh, to uh, uh, possibly change or strengthen their plan. We have a crisis now in New York City. We've had it, and frankly, every month that we wait uh, is a, uh, uh, an opportunity that's lost for workers to begin saving for their own retirement. And the dollar you save today goes farther than the dollar you save next week or uh, next month or next year. And so the sooner we can get this up and running, the better it is for folks to be preparing for their own retirement. I don't think we can uh, wait for New York State to possibly take some action that there's absolutely no guarantee that they will take. Could, could we talk briefly about some of the program parameters and, and, and uh, employee contribution rates and, and what that looks like? There are some folks that are, that are very much concerned and, and um, so we can kind of get out to the public um, before we get into the education piece, but, but really explain to the folks that are here in this room here what that would look like and, and the advantages of doing so. So you're talking about the contribution rate. Should we start with that, Mr. Yes. Chair? Yeah. So um, the administration proposes a 5% uh, contribution rate, which is the default contribution rate. Now, workers can change that rate as much as they want, up or down, within the uh, limits of an IRA uh, contribution, which is 6000 uh, per year for someone who's under 50 and then uh, 7000 for uh, age 50 and up. Um, that is the rate that the three states that are in operation, Illinois, uh, Oregon, and California, are using. And uh, they have found that um, it, uh, using that rate does not deter people from participation. And in fact, uh, the average contribution rate has been above 5% uh, so far. So it seems like uh, certainly 5% would be preferable to 3% just because people will save more money and be better prepared uh, for their retirement. And again, if someone wants to participate in the program but thinks that they can't afford 5%, they can only afford 3% or 2%, th they will absolutely be able to do that and they can change it at any time they want to as well. So um, we're, we, we would suggest making the default rate 5%. Okay. Um, I have a few more questions, but certainly I want to throw it over. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> Councilmember Adams. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Miller. I think that's a first for Councilmember Kalo, so we're happy about that. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, and, and your testimony this morning. This is a cause that I think that uh, all of us in this room really do uh, want to champion. So thank you very much. I just have a couple of questions. Chair Miller asked about um, specifications and qualifications as it pertains to providers. Uh, my question has to do more with qualifications of board members, appointees by the mayor. Um, what are some of the qualifications that you believe a board member should have? 
Well, I think, first of all, we want to pick a board that has a diversity of experience, so they're not all from the same, uh, you know, specific uh, area of expertise. You want someone who is experienced in retirement plans in this specific area uh, of, of uh, retirement plans uh, for private sector workers. Uh, I think we want someone who has experience with the employees, uh, either as a representative of employees or has worked with employee groups, so they can bring to it uh, their understanding of what employees need for this program to succeed for them. And then you also want someone who's got experience with the small businesses uh, that will be the primary uh, participants uh, uh, in the plan. So, uh, you know, someone who represents an employer association or has experience as a small business owner uh, so that they can bring that experience to bear so that when the board is debating, uh, you know, uh, rules or policies that they want to put in place, we make sure that they have this breadth of experience uh, to, uh, uh, to really be able to make the program work for all the stakeholders that will be involved. Thank you. Do you, uh, well, I'm gonna ask a question, um, redundant question, a rhetorical question. How do you see yourself fitting into that decision-making process? You know, I, that'll be up to the mayor. I, I really don't know. Um, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a policy uh, person in, in this regard. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I'll be, uh, I, I'd be happy to serve if, if I'm asked, but uh, I, I really don't know what my role will be once the program uh, is passed, should the program be passed by the city council. Okay, fair enough. Just one more question for you. What process does the Mayor's Office of Pension and Investments currently have in place to increase MWBE brokerage participation? Uh, the great question, uh, uh, council member. Um, so the Mayor's Office of Pensions and Investments serves as uh, the Mayor's trustee on the different um, pension fund boards and also on the Deferred Compensation Plan. So um, one of the things that we have championed is putting in uh, language to encourage MWBEs uh, to apply for uh, mandates at the uh, Deferred Compensation Plan, and in fact, since I've been there, we have uh, uh, increased the MWBE uh, management, management by MWBE firms of the Deferred Compensation Plan from zero to now approximately $2 billion. Uh, there were literally no MWBEs managing money for the uh, DCP when, when I began uh, my tenure on that board. We put in place language encouraging, and now we have uh, $2 billion or in excess of $2 billion being managed by those firms. In addition, in our role as trustees uh, at the, uh, uh, you know, at the five New York City, actually four of the New York City retirement systems, we champion uh, MWBE firms. And specifically right now, we are working on a, uh, a resolution uh, at, uh, at one of the, uh, uh, funds, uh, NICERS, uh, which uh, imagine many of you are participants in it, as I am, um, to uh, specifically uh, uh, put uh, a policy in place to increase MWBE utilization at the board. That's not passed yet, so it's not policy, but it's something that we've been working on. So that's what I would say. That's really encouraging, Mr. Adler. Thank you so much for your testimony once again. Thank you, Thank you. Council Member. Council Member King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you again, John. I appreciate today's conversation. Um, I want to say thank you again. I think this is a really smart piece of legislation to the chair, um, Kalos. Um, I'd like to be signed on to this as well, because um, one of the things that breaks my heart is to watch a 70-year-old having to go to work as opposed to working because it's their choice or it's a hobby because they haven't had the financial stability or planning so they can relax in their golden years. So this is one of the reasons why this makes sense to get this done the best way we can possibly get it done. But as someone as a policy person that's in your position, when you reviewed this policy, did you see any flaws in this policy in its implementation or any challenges for us getting it done? And if so, what would be your answer to try to correct those issues? Well. I don't think there's flaws within the limits uh, that we have uh, as a city 
uh, under federal law. So essentially what this legislation does is it says, okay, within the limits prescribed by federal pension law, federal tax law, this is what we can do to maximize uh, access to retirement plan coverage. And I think it does that. I think it does that. You know, I, I have to say, I'm not the one, I've been pushing for this, but I'm not the one who dreamed up uh, this approach uh, to uh, I I increasing retirement security. And many of the advocates in the room, I would credit uh, with uh, doing that dreaming up. My job is, uh, has always been to try to push stuff forward. Uh, and understand what the different options are and push for what I think the best options are. So I think this is the best option within the limits of federal law. Uh, if uh, you know, federal law were to change and it would be possible, for example, to allow for employer contributions in a plan like this, I think that would be a great thing. Uh, but uh, what, again, given those limitations, I think this is the best that, that we can have. And I think that, um, Frankly, following in the footsteps of the states that have uh, started moving forward, Illinois, Oregon, uh, California, soon, soon to be joined by other states, we can learn from their experiences and avoid some of the hiccups in implementation that they may have had at the very beginning. And my final question would be, I heard you mention something about 5%. I think it was 3% of contributions was kind of laid out, but you think 5% makes sense? Yes. Um, I know one day all of us will be in that same state of mind of um, how does when investments that we have with 5% make sense, how do you have the conversation with someone who's, at, after this is implemented, because I'm assuming this is a good piece of legislation that we're getting implemented of how they figure how to manage um, if 5% is too much for them based on what they bring home every week or two weeks. How do you manage that conversation with somebody as opposed to telling them 3% or how, how do you have that conversation with somebody? Because they still got to figure out how to buy groceries, get home, and take care of stuff. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, my, my, the way you manage the conversation is you say you should, uh, you should deduct whatever you think you can afford to save for your retirement. And so if you can only afford 3%, then you should make that deduction 3%. If you can uh, afford 7%, then you should make the deduction 7%. You should make it exactly what you think you can live with. And what I, what I might say is, why don't you try 5% and see how it goes. And if you find that you're actually unable to make ends meet with the 5%, then lower it to 3% or, or you know, try to make it as much as you can because the reality is uh, the dollar that you put aside today for your retirement will be magnified uh, many, many times when it becomes time to retire. And the earlier you save, the more time there is for that money to expand. And so that's what I would say. It's not, the, the 5% is not mandatory. Mm -hmm. It's just the default, which means that anybody can change it at any time, raise it up, lower it down, or if they need to, opt out. Um, I want to thank you today. Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you for today's conversation. I think it's this is smart what we're doing today. And, uh, and if you do find or hear of anything that's any challenges to our seasoned, I call seasoned individuals, um, please let us know how we can make sure that this is, because this is one of those things we can't mess up, we shouldn't mess up, and come back because it's the right thing to do. Thank, thank you again, Thank Mr. you, Chair. Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, yep, al along that lines, um, can you talk about some of the efforts that the city has undertaken in, in, in order to expand the conversation about retirement for city residents? Um, what, what does that look like? What does it look like now? And what does it look like around implementation of the program? I'm sorry, could you, I didn't so, quite the, so, understand um, the question. Right now, what efforts has the city undertaken in order to uh, to expand this conversation, as, as, as Councilmember King was just articulating, um, to those who potentially would be enrolled, or just the um, the value of, of of a savings plan? Right. And we understand that we, as as a society, um, recognize the data and that we are potentially going to be taking care of a lot of folk. Uh, of uh, the next generation of retirees, right? right. Because uh, of the diminishing uh, guaranteed pensions and 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 uh, benefits that that generations before us had had um, taken advantage of and enjoyed. 
what are we doing to expand this conversation? And what is that? What does our target audience look like? So what are we doing now or what will we be doing? What, what are we doing now to generate a conversation? Right. What are we doing around implementation, not just so and that should it also include understanding, as you said, what the board should look like and, and, and being a voice for particular needs and values of this diverse universe that we're trying to capture here. What does that look like? Well, I think I can speak to what we're planning to do. I'm not sure I can speak that well to what we're doing now because I don't think we're doing that much, except the one exception I will say is that um, under the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, we have the Office of Financial Empowerment, which I'm sure you are, are all familiar with. And I think one of the uh, functions that they serve is to help uh, workers and, you know, New, York, New Yorkers uh, understand their financial situation, including to prepare for their retirement. Uh, and I think that will be a valuable resource going forward as well once we implement this program. So if folks need financial advice, they can seek out those centers to get it because the program will not provide financial advice and the city itself will not provide financial advice. That's not a function that the city plays. In terms of uh, once the program uh, is implemented, we uh, plan a comprehensive targeted outreach campaign to businesses and to employees uh, to help them understand how the program works and uh, the specifics of participating in the program, enrollment, uh, how to uh, you know, make your contributions, uh, your withdrawals, change your options, uh, you know, any, any of those functions. And that would be a part of the comprehensive education and outreach effort that the program would undertake once it's uh, uh, beginning to get ready to implement. So um, a couple of layers with that being said, um, and speaking to, to the latter portion, does the city, uh, what agency would be responsible for its implementation um, if, of course, if it's, if it's DCS, uh, and I know I'm putting more work on you there, um, do, do we have the capacity to, to address that? Or what, what, what does that partnership look like if, if necessary? And, and, and then the other portion, we, we, let me just say that um, in terms of the target audience, um, we in Southeast Queens, we have this uh, Senior Appreciation Month in, in which we, um, recognize the contributions of, of our senior community, and uh, we probably service tens of thousands of seniors in a number of different programs. Uh, um, last week we had uh, 300 seniors in with kind of a will and trust and other uh, uh, financial literacy and planning and, and things of that nature that we have an event this afternoon. And, and so we could kind of contour some of that around education, but there's also the real target audience, which is young people, right. communities of color, those who have kind of, whether they've had the vehicle to save or have not um, had the legacy of, of, of saving. How do, how do we get to them? How do we reach that target audience? And how do we do it in advance to have the conversation is kind of what I was trying to say so that um, when this thing is up and running that we meet that we're meeting the, our target numbers in order for to have a successful program. Right, it's a great question, uh, Chair Miller. Uh, the truth is, we we have not. You're asking about specifics that we have not yet, uh, you know, decided or uh, uh, move forward on. Uh, I think the idea of doing uh, targeted outreach in advance of the program opening up is a great idea and we should include that in the plan for rolling out the program once it gets up and running, once this board uh, is appointed. And in terms of the agency, we don't know yet which agency it will be. That's still under discussion. Uh, you know, we need to see what the final legislation uh, looks like, and then uh, the administration will uh, uh, determine which agency it's best suited, is best suited to uh, uh, operate it uh, to ensure the success of the program. So thank you, and and uh, myself and, and Councilman Michaelos are obviously um, 
have some ideas about that. And um, so this is something that we've been working on for a number of years and hope that, um, that we can continue to partner with the administration to make sure that we can get this thing up and running uh, and, and so that is, uh, folks can really take advantage of it. Speaking of which, um, and my question is to, have, have you heard, have you gotten any feedback from folks in the financial planning community about the city having some type of uh, unfair advantage and, and kind of undermining those folks who are at um, times questionable? Yeah, well, what's interesting is that uh, there are some groups of, uh, you know, independent financial service uh, firms that really welcome this because they see it as a possible uh, gain for their businesses in two ways, which I'll explain. Uh, the first is that uh, some businesses will choose to offer their own retirement plan rather than enroll in the city's plan because it would allow them to contribute, should they see fit, alongside their employees' uh, contributions for the plan. And those businesses will then turn to, you know, local mom and pop independent financial planning firms to help them set up those, um, uh, those plans for the business. The second thing is that, look, this will be uh, the start for many people, the first opportunity they have to save. But for many of those people, I would, I would surmise thousands of those people, they will eventually move on to other jobs that do have uh, retirement plans, uh, employer-based plans, and they will need financial advice uh, to figure out what to do with that money. And they will turn to these smaller independent financial planning firms for business. So we, uh, we think, and, and there are some in the financial planning community who agree that um, these uh, uh, f types of plans will actually uh, help them grow their businesses. It's, it's, within this program, is there, is, are employers of small businesses that tend more, are they allowed themselves to contribute? In, in, in this employers, program, yes. employers cannot. So that's, employers cannot make contributions because otherwise it would become an employee benefit plan that is no. preempted by federal law. Are, are the, the employers for themselves? Oh, for themselves, as employees of the firm. You mean yes. as an employee, sure. An employee, in other words, for, for, let me say two things. First is, sir, any employee of a business, including the, uh, you know, the owner of the business who uh, pays himself or herself uh, a salary, can, can do payroll deductions to uh, contribute to the plan, absolutely. And then secondly, um, if you have uh, you know, a sole employer, you know, like a, a one-person business, you know, that person can voluntarily sign up and make contributions themselves if they choose to. So, for example, if you think about, um, you know, freelancers, for mm -hmm. example, if they wanted to contribute, they could sign themselves up and make contributions to this plan, uh, which would be easy and low cost and so it could be advantageous to them. Uh, that, that's excellent to know. There's, there are often times that I hear from small businesses that they themselves don't have a retirement savings plan. Yeah. In, in fact, the matter is that the, their, their retirement savings plan is often selling their business. Yeah. And, and, and putting potential workers at risk of, of, of losing their employment because we, unfortunately, we live in a time where real estate is often more valuable than a business and, and that business does not continue and we see workers that may have been with a particular employer for, for generations, you know, and um, they lose, they just lose out, everybody lose out. So it's important that business can re remain in business here in the city simply because uh, the employer can now afford to, uh, or has access to a retirement program themselves. So that, that is good news. Absolutely. I'm gonna hear from uh, Councilman Kalos, and I knew he couldn't hold out for much longer. Then. I just wanna thank uh, Civil Service and Labor Chair Janique Miller. It is a testament to how long he's been working on this and uh, how deeply he's involved that 
We actually asked almost every single question there was to ask on this topic. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank John Adler <coughs> for your uh, testimony. I, I didn't realize how soon after you got to SEIU that we began working together, and I'm so grateful for your work in uh, founding the Center for Retirement Initiatives at the uh, Georgetown University. One of the uh, facts that I learned from them in preparation for this hearing is that since 2012, at least 43 states have acted to, and I quote, have acted to implement a new program, undertake a study of a program option, or consider legislation to establish state-facilitated retirement savings programs. So with that in mind and the fact that not only is this 10 states, but it could be 43, what would portability look like? Um, <clears throat> well, the plans really are completely portable because they're IRAs. So an IRA, a, a worker who, who changes jobs with an IRA can choose to leave the money in the account and continue to accrue investment returns. Uh, they could roll it over to another uh, account, either another IRA that, that they set up or to um, you know, another qualified retirement plan like a 401k that accepts um, rollovers, or they could take the money and put it in, an, if let's say you're saying uh, they move to another state, let's say someone moved from New York to California, uh, if, Cal if the California plan accepts rollovers, and I actually don't know whether they do, but if they did, then they could roll the money over to the California plan. They could also, I mean, the reality is that these accounts uh, will continue to, uh, you know, they don't just sit there and do nothing. They, they gain uh, investment returns based on whatever uh, option, investment option you choose. So you can leave it there. You could leave it there for 30 years until you retire and then, and then start to take retirement income from it. So they're, they're highly flexible. The IRA structure makes them very, very flexible. And just for the record, that's the time, I, the 2011, when I started working on this uh, area for SEIU. I started with SEIU uh, in 1992. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Ms. Aaron, for your testimony. Um, we're now gonna hear from the next panel. Thank you. Next panel, Alex Gleason, New York City Central Labor Council. Andrew Riggi. Aaliyah Robinson. And Michelle Evermore. Good afternoon, panel, some of my favorite folk. I'd like to say New Yorkers, but everybody's not here now. So um, please state your name um, clearly, and we are on a three-minute time clock. So you can begin at either end. Thank you, and good afternoon. Well, good morning, I think, still. Um, Chairman Miller and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, thank you for the opportunity to join you today to comment on Introduction 888. My name is Aaliyah Robinson, and I am the Senior Vice President of Retirement and Compensation Policy for the ERISA Industry Committee, otherwise known as ERIC. I have submitted a written statement which details ERIC's recommendations and would like to really focus on the primary concern of ERIC's members which is the maintenance of ERISA preemption. ERIC represents large plan sponsors that operate 
individually in most, if not all, states in the nation. ERISA preemption allows these employers to provide consistent and uniform benefits across their entire workforce. Therefore, an employee that works for Company X in New York is able to access the same benefits as employees in California and Georgia who also work for Company X. ERIC members use ERISA covered benefits to remain competitive and to create a uniform workforce culture across the company regardless of the employee's location. Furthermore, ERISA provided benefits achieve the goal that this bill is trying to reach, greater participation in retirement plans. According to a report by the Stanford Center, Stanford Center on Longevity, 89 to 91% of workers offered a retirement plan participate in that plan. Therefore, this committee should not do anything to undermine that success. For these reasons, we make the following recommendations. And we do think these recommendations are oversights, and we do hope that the introduction can be amended to provide, to include these recommendations. First, introduction 888 should provide a complete exclusion for all employers that offer a retirement plan under ERISA and not base that exclusion on the definition of an eligible employee. In the, inter in the alternative to the complete exclusion, the definition of an eligible employee should be amended to conform with the el employee eligibility requirements under ERISA. Such coordination includes setting the eligibility age at age 21 and allowing employee employers to limit participation in the retirement plan to employees who do not exceed 1,000 hours of service per year. Finally, the program should automatically exempt, without a reporting requirement, employers that provide a retirement plan under ERISA. ERIC has worked with Oregon, Illinois, and California to secure exemptions for ERIC members from reporting requirements, and we are willing to work with you to provide similar exemptions here. It is important to re reiterate that without ERISA preemption, multi-state plan sponsors at a minimum will face undue administrative burdens and at the most will be unable to offer uniform ben benefits to their entire workforce that allows them to create a comprehensive workforce culture and remain competitive. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to take any questions. I would like to thank uh, Committee Chair Miller, uh, Committee Member Kalos, and the members of this committee for the opportunity to appear today to support legislation to improve access to retirement security for workers in New York City. My name is Michelle Evermore. I'm a senior researcher and policy analyst for the National Employment Law Project. A quiet crisis is brewing. Retirement security involves many issues that the public at large find intimidating to talk about, much less follow politically. People still may recall pension raids of the private sector pl plans in the past, or the devastating bankruptcies at Enron and WorldCom in the early 2000s. It's difficult for people to feel that they have the power to change things. We have a system that not everybody has access to, but everyone subsidizes through the tax code. And that access has racial implications. Economist Nari Ree found that only 50% of black and Asian employees and 38% of Latinx employees between the ages of 25 and 64 work for an employer that sponsors a retirement plan compared to 62% of white employees. The racial wealth gap, perhaps more of a chasm, has increased 33% between 19, 1983 and 2016. We must start to level the playing field, and this is a small but positive step in that direction. There are reasons that people don't just go out to a broker and buy an IRA off the shelf. First, the initial buy-in can be as much as $1,000, but also saving for retirement goes against a great deal of human nature, like overcoming inertia and prioritizing our future selves. There's a study that pension policy folks talk about, the Stanford Jam experiment. Um, it's been duplicated over time, but it boils down to this. Uh, Consumers were given a, a, a finite number of jams to taste, and we had a small number of jams to choose from. They generally bought a jar of jam from the, from the vendor. But as the number of jams increased, people, uh, uh, participation started to drop off. People didn't want to buy jam anymore. Now, imagine that jar of jam is actually dozens of providers selling a complicated financial instrument with 12 kinds of fees and hundreds of possible investments. It's just not reaching regular working people. Passing this legislation would give every New Yorker access to a good, low-fee, professionally managed plan with a safe default investment. 
The auto-enrollment feature will help to address inertia issues. One Vanguard study showed an increase from 47% participation before auto-enrollment to 93% after. A competent board can make sure that the investment options are good low fee choices and can help to clear up decision paralysis. And the involvement of accountable public services um, servants can help to overcome citizen, uh, uh, cynicism about the legitimacy of the, the investment. Um, while the current retiring sy retirement system is skewed to higher income workers, this publicly run program can begin to address this massive inequality. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Councilmember Kalos and Miller. My name is Alex Gleason, and I'm the Director of Policy Research and Legislation at the New York City Central Labor Council of the AFL-CIO. Comprised of 1.3 million workers across 300 affiliated unions, the New York City Central Labor Council, AFL-CIO, recognizes the necessity to address retirement security. New York City and the United States are in the midst of a retirement security crisis. Retirement is a slow-moving crisis because despite income level, most workers approaching retirement age simply do not have enough saved to retire. Research finds the medium account, median account balance for workers uh, nationally aged 55 to 64 is just $15,000 and $18,000 in New York State with approximately two-thirds of workers in the bottom half of the income distribution both at the state and federal level with nothing saved for retirement. This is not relegated to low-income people, as even those earning in the top 10% have a median balance of just $200,000, which is meant to last for the entirety of retirement. Low to non-existent retirement account balances will leave many from a myriad of incomes with an insufficient replacement rate in their post-work years. Experts assert the key to sound retirement is replacing as much monthly income from working as possible with income saved in retirement. It has been described as a stool with three legs, savings, social security, and a retirement plan. Startlingly, 65% of New Yorkers are not covered by a plan, many lack any savings at all, and most will rely solely on social security income, approximately $1,471 per month. Most people in New York City will not be able to retire, with the New School Schwartz Center estimating as many as 825,000 in the state, 41% will experience downward mobility. One impact of growing retirement insecurity is the sandwiching pressure on working age children of the elderly who have children themselves. Elderly people without adequate retirement savings may rely on their grown children for support, which in turn puts pressure on those adults working. Adult workers with both aging parents and growing children are effectively squeezed into supporting both the generation below and above, ironically making it harder to save for retirement themselves and perpetuating the downward decline in standards of living. The most effective plan to prepare for retirement is a defined benefit pension. Pensions have provided lifelong income to workers, which contribute to the three-legged stool necessary to retire. Among workers, 70% have a retirement plan in unions, which is a hard-fought victory that has transformed the lives of those people. Historically, the growth of collective bargaining has led to greater retirement security for workers. With this legislation, New York City has an opportunity to provide individuals a vehicle to prepare for the future and save for retirement. Intros number 888 and 901 are impor important first steps to providing individuals in the city a foundation to save. It is necessary to incentivize as much saving for retirement as possible, and any efforts to do so by the city should be commended. Good afternoon, my name is Andrew Riggi. I am the Executive Director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents restaurants and nightlife establishments throughout the five boroughs. Um, clearly, as we have discussed in the past, there is a growing concern, especially among small businesses, about the increasing number of administrative burdens that they are required to manage. Uh, that being said, we do understand the importance of this issue, and I've ex uh, submitted written comments, but did want to take this time to address a few matters. Uh, the issue of ERISA has come up. Uh, we have comments in our testimony that address that. Uh, but specifically to the restaurant and nightlife industry, where workers can earn a significant uh, amount of their income from tips, which they leave uh, with after their shift, uh, results in a weekly paycheck that can be either close to zero or in some cases negative. That is because the uh, taxes from the 
tip income is taken out of their weekly paycheck. So we find it difficult to understand how an employee would be able to uh, make a direct contribution with a zero or negative paycheck. Uh, a second point comes uh, the documentation status of certain workers. It's our understanding that many of these uh, benefit programs require the submission of a Social Security or a TIN number. Uh, in certain industries, this can certainly be a challenge if an employer is required to provide information about the benefit program to their employees and they respond that they would like to participate but are unable to provide a uh, uh, identification number, we need to figure out how that would exactly work. You may also be aware that the Social Security Administration has been submitting uh, to employers uh, no match letters, basically stating that an employee's Social Security number that was submitted upon employment uh, does not match what they have in their records. Therefore, in certain cases, we believe you could have someone making contributions uh, under the identification number of another person, which is something that we believe also needs to be written about or addressed. Finally, there was a comment made about the administrative fees and the cost to administer such a program by the city. I just want to let you know that I've spoken with many of our members, smaller restaurants and some of the larger restaurant groups leading up to this hearing. And they said generally, almost 100% consensus, when they have offered these programs to their hourly employees, there has been almost zero uh, participation in them. They are usually uh, you know, taken advantage of by either management uh, level employees or more kind of executive level. So that's just something to express that we haven't found much participation, but we'd certainly be interested in working with the council to find ways to better provide information and encourage employees to participate, but that's something that's definitely uh, important because we just have not found that much participation. And thank you, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much uh, for the panel. Yes, I'll, I'll go in uh, re reverse order, just starting with Hospitality Alliance. Uh, I understand the anecdotal experience in terms of voluntary sign-on. Uh, there's been a lot of testimony today already that having auto-enrollment increases uh, sign up by 15 times. Is it something that you think your members might be open to as a default versus trying to beg people to sign to, to join in? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. I'd have to go back and speak with them. You know, if you were to have an auto enrollment, mm -hmm. but the belief behind my comment stays true, where most employees, for whatever reason, do not want to participate, it would seem that it would create more of an additional administrative challenge to then manage them opting out. Um, but I'd be happy to go back and have those discussions. How long does it take a business to set up? payroll for a single employee as they move people on and off? For, uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, but it's a part of doing business, you have to Sure, make. yes, absolutely, we understand, and I'd also, you know, restaurant and especially a lot of small business, there's a high, you know, turnover, so there's quite a bit of administrative just with the onboarding and offboarding process. And is there any federal or state requirements relating to payroll deductions that uh, employers already have to deal with? Um, such as child support payments or... Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so I mean, most of you're working with a payroll company, um, you know, there's a list of the deductions, certain taxes are automated, others are being updated. So while certain something that's manageable, I, my point, I think, which is going to your implication is that, yes, they are already doing this as a course of business, but it is adding an additional uh, step, and when it's something that would be required of every employee, um, so yeah, I guess the, the step here is so, and then do any of your members already offer retirement programs? Yeah, so many of the, I don't know the exact percentage, but yes, businesses do offer retirement programs. They find more participation among either managerial or executive level employees, and usually the hourly employees uh, tend to opt out. I was just speaking with someone, a larger group with about 600 employees, and they say they've maybe just well, had- They're not know, opting out, they're failing to opt in, but I guess, uh, administering a plan, mm -hmm. they're doing all the work versus here they're just 
starting off when, when they onboard a payroll deduction. So I guess uh, that, that was just the point I wanted to uh, make. I want to go to uh, the ERISA Industry Committee. In your testimony, you specifically provide language um, <clears throat> uh, suggesting that the, uh, an exclusion for all employ and I quote, an exclusion for all employers that offer retirement plan under ERISA uh, and not based on the exclusion of the definition of eligible employee. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in the DOJ statement of interest in Jarvis, I quote, this preemption regime is of course not boundless where a state law is indifferent as to the ERISA coverage of plans within its scope, such as where the law affects a broad class of arrangements that may incidentally contain ERISA plans. Such a law does not make reference to ERISA and does not trigger preemption. Do you st where do your recommendations stand with, with, with regards to Jarvis and the DOJ's recent statement of interest? Well, I did not get a chance to weigh in with the DOJ, so I don't know how they would feel about it. The language I gave was an example used under the Illinois Secure Choice, and just from Eric's perspective, we think that language provides a clearer path to make just make it clear that employers that are providing an ERISA plan aren't subject to um, the city proposal. Are you open to a broad exemption just to anyone offering a retirement vehicle, regardless of whether or not it is ERISA? We're definitely open to that. Great, and then um, to the National Employment Law Project. Uh, I made reference to it in my comments about John Oliver who did a show about this exact topic, but it was not something you got to in your brief three minutes. Uh, can you just elucidate what's the issue with fees and these retirement accounts and uh, what, what could possibly be the damage here? Um, according to the SEC, an additional 1% paid in fees on a $100,000 investment can cost the investor $28,000 over 20 years. Put another way, according to, the AARP, uh, according to an AARP study many years ago, a 1% increase in fees could mean an ultimate account balance that's 20% lower. That's because um, fees compound exactly the way that other interest does. So. A little bit of fees this year means more next year and more next year. It's, it, it's cumulative. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. And um, I want to thank this panel for your thoughtful insight. And um, certainly we'll be calling on you again. But I do want to just uh, shout out the CLC for his testimony. Um, obviously, we have, uh, um, this is something that we've worked on for a while. We've obviously had to have conversations about it that we are, and I think that we are um, of the same mindset that it is the defined uh, benefit pension that we all aspire to have and that it has diminished in the American workforce. And even where it exists, it has to be a multi-pronged approach to uh, be able to have the quality of life with the ever increasing cost of living that that is taking place and, and I'm glad that we have all of these uh, voices at the table as we move forward and try to do what uh, we've all been tasked with doing is providing the quality of life for for workers particularly in their retirement years so thank you so much to the panel and we're going to call the next panel now thank you Carolyn Crawford, Allison, from the American Retirement Association. I'm not just that last. <laughs> uh, from the American Retirement Association. Uh, Angela Antonelli. Angela Antonelli. Richard Majanski. Okay. Richard yep. from a new school. And Richard McGahey. Lissette Velez. And then, then we do. Okay, please state your name, speak directly into the microphone, and we could start at either end when you're ready.
Hi, my name is Caroline Crawford. I represent the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College, and my testimony today is joint with Alicia Manel. I thank you for inviting us today to testify regarding New York City's proposed retirement savings plan. My colleagues and I at the Center have worked with Oregon, Illinois, and Connecticut on their auto IRA programs, and my purpose today is to share some of what we've learned, which may help inform New York City's efforts. In our experience, three criteria are essential to success. First, mandating employer participation and the explicit use of enforcement mechanisms. Second, minimizing employee opt-out behavior. And third, setting a significant default employee contribution rate. I'll touch briefly on each of these three points and will refer you to my written testimony for further detail. The first criteria is ensuring employer participation through the use of an employer mandate with enforcement mechanisms. Employer participation is critical to both the financial feasibility of the program as well as employee reach. A mandate is absolutely necessary to get employers on board. However, experience in Oregon Saves has shown that employer mandate is not enough. Employer enrollment has been slower than expected in Oregon, in part that can be attributed to their lack of explicit enforcement mechanisms set out at the outset of the program. And so an employer mandate must be coupled with explicit penalties for employer noncompliance. And New York City's current proposal does have both elements addressed. The second criteria is minimizing employee opt-out behavior. Once employers sign up, the next challenge is to keep these employees participating. Importantly, employees without a plan at work differ from covered workers in several key ways. Uncovered workers tend to work fewer hours, tend to earn less in wages, and tend to switch jobs more frequently. Oregon has done a good job in keeping the majority of participants in the program, and in part this can be attributed to their communications campaign, which is focused on education through simple and concrete content. The third criteria I'd like to address today and really emphasize here is the importance of setting a default contribution rate that's sufficient to generate enough revenue for program financial feasibility and, importantly, to accumulate meaningful account balances for retirees. Um, as addressed earlier today, New York City's proposal has that 3% rate. Um, analyses at the center has shown that a 5% rate at minimum is necessary for both financial feasibility and employee balances. Um, our analyses of other auto IRA programs have shown that the higher the contribution rate, the less time it takes for states to become cost neutral and the less time it will take for an administrator to become profitable. And when seeking for an administrator's bid, these are the elements they'll be considering. Um, importantly, I'd like to stress before concluding that increasing default contribution rates has not been shown to decrease uh, participation from employees and that employees do tend to stick to the default rate. So in conclusion, with the current proposal, while it does include an, an employer mandate with explicit enforcement mechanisms, the 3% default contribution rate the center believes will be simply insufficient uh, for both goals of the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miller and other members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee for the opportunity to speak with you today about Introduction 888. My name is Allison Wheelabob. Yes, that is my given name. And I serve as General Counsel of the American Retirement Association. Today I speak on behalf of the ARA and its five underlying affiliate organizations which represent the full spectrum of America's private retirement system. This includes actuaries, administrators, accountants, and attorneys, and financial advisors focused on working with the sponsors of qualified plans. We strongly support the goal of helping the citizens of New York City strengthen their retirement security by facilitating well-designed workplace-based retirement plans, and we have consistently and actively supported proposals to expand retirement plan coverage in the private workforce. It's our long-held belief that automatic enrollment is an important and an effective tool for increasing savings rates and employee participation. Moreover, we have also supported proposals and programs run by states and localities that are designed to promote and facilitate retirement savings by those who are not covered by an employer plan. With this in mind, our concerns regarding the proposal fall into two general categories. 
The proposal should automatically exempt employers that sponsor an ERISA-covered plan rather than base applicability on the meaning of eligible employee. And this program should not require covered employees to use the city's retirement savings options, and employers should be allowed to select a payroll deduction IRA or qualified plan from the marketplace. We think that the pros proposal would place undue complexity and burdens on employers by imposing a set of rules that parallel the extensive and effective set of federal rules that already apply to workplace retirement plans. ERISA enables employers to structure their plans that meet the needs of their workforce and provides comprehensive governance at the federal level. In enacting ERISA, Congress recognized the potential for differing state standards and provided for preemption of conflicting state and local laws. Congressional intent was that ERISA would occupy the field and supersede the oper operation of state and local law on the same subject matter without regard to whether or not an actual conflict exists. So said the Supreme Court. We're concerned that the proposal overlaps with ERISA's comprehensive governance of private sector plans. And as you know, similar proposals in several states, including Oregon, California, Illinois, Maryland, and New Jersey, to name a few, exempt employers that offer a risk covered plan to their employee. The ARA recommends that the proposal be amended to automatically exempt employers that provide an ERISA covered plan rather than base applicability on the meaning of eligible employee. We recognize that far too many Americans lack access to a retirement plan at work and employers may choose from among many plans available at reasonable cost, including straightforward payroll deduction programs. The problem is that many business owners are understandably focused on running their businesses rather than focus on offering a retirement plan to their employees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Chairman Miller. Chairman Miller, members of the committee, I'm Angela Antonelli, research professor and executive director of the Center for Retirement Initiatives at Georgetown University. Thank you for your leadership and this opportunity today. The views I express are my own and shouldn't be construed to represent any official position of Georgetown. Uh, as you know, about one half of the private sector workforce nationally lacks access to an employer-sponsored retirement plan. In New York City, that number is almost 60 percent of the private sector workforce. A readily available workplace retirement savings plan dramatically increases the likelihood that workers will begin to save for retirement. Since 2012, more than 40 states have introduced legislation related to state-facilitated retirement savings programs. As of September 2019, there are 11 new state-facilitated programs that have been enacted in 10 states and one city. The Ottawa the IRA model is the predominant model in new programs and legislative initiatives. Six states and one city have enacted laws establishing these payroll deduction IRA programs. Of those auto IRA states, three, Oregon, Illinois, and California have launched and are already enrolling workers. A review of bills introduced in states in 2018 and 2019 show that most are introducing the auto IRA model. In addition, states that enacted a different program model, notably a marketplace, are beginning to move toward an auto IRA approach. There are several positive trends that illustrate why these auto IRA programs are a smart approach. Number one, employers and workers strongly support the program. The level of support has only grown stronger as more workers become familiar with them. For example, 82% of the people in Oregon support Oregon Saves after its first year of implementation. In addition, the participation rate of eligible employees have remained high, averaging more than 70% for Oregon. Number two, employee contribution levels are important to success. As you've heard, when these programs were first being developed, a 3% rate was considered but experience shows workers are comfortable with a 5% savings rate and are saving more than an average of $100 a month. Number three, assets are growing rapidly for Oregon Saves. Assets are now approaching more than $25 million, reflecting a steady and rapidly increasing upward trend. And Illinois Secure Choice uh, has already surpassed $5 million in its first, first eight months. And four, fees are already decreasing. The investment fund fee reductions have already occurred with Oregon Saves with two of their funds. A new state-facilitated auto IRA program for New York City will change the retirement landscape in, in nine important ways. It will help millions of workers better prepare for retirement because saving something is better than saving nothing at all. Number two, it will help small businesses be more competitive in the search for talent and recruiting workers. Number three, it will allow employees to be more mobile, making it easier for them to move between jobs and keep their accounts when they move. Number four, it will have the potential to assist gig workers by voluntarily allowing them to use the program. Number five, it will benefit underserved population, especially Hispanic workers. Number six, it will reduce the burden on state and federal budgets if fewer pure 
fewer poor seniors have to rely on public programs to make ends meet. Number seven, it will be a model for other states. Number eight, it will inspire innovation. And number nine, it will create new opportunities for the private sector to help new savers manage their money and challenge them to develop more cost-effective plans. The scale of a program in New York City will make a meaningful difference for residents while providing valuable models and lessons to guide future action for the rest of the nation. Thank you very much, and please accept my much more detailed statement for the record. Uh, Chairman Miller, uh, Councilman Kalos, uh, thanks for this opportunity to testify. My name is Rick McGahee. I'm a senior fellow at the Schwartz Center at the New School. I'm the former uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of Labor for overseeing ERISA. I was nominated by President Clinton and confirmed by the Senate in that position. Also served as the U.S. Senate's Chief Economist uh, on the Labor Committee and Economic Advisor to Senator uh, Edward Kennedy on these issues. Uh, there's a lot of data that's been thrown here, including some of ours uh, reports, so I'm not going to repeat all that, uh, but we're happy to submit that I have a longer statement for the record that goes into this. But just, I'm also not, a, there's nothing official from the new school, uh, but you've put your finger on, on the main problem here, that we have a lack of pension coverage, a lack of universal pension coverage in New York City, two-thirds of workers, millions of workers in New York City do not have access to a workplace pension coverage. Uh, and I think that number is pretty staggering. The, the other thing to note is that among current workers who have uh, uh, plans, they're in danger of falling into poverty when they retire. A lot of workers who make above a poverty level wage now, because of the lack of retirement, uh, we estimate there could be over 400,000 workers in New York are in danger of falling into poverty once they retire. And these are workers who are not currently working in poverty. For the ones working in poverty, they also are in danger of that. So we have got a real, real crisis on hand. I want to commend the city in its great history. New York City has always been a leader in looking for progressive ways to address problems, and I think this program falls uh, directly into it. Uh, the proposal follows a model that's shown success in many states, as, as other witnesses have testified to. Our director, Teresa Gilharducci, has been uh, an important figure. She, sorry she couldn't be here directly to testify today, but the Schwartz Center has been a big advocate and a big uh, researcher and uh, assistant to a lot of these states on these issues, and we stand ready to help the council uh, as you move forward. Uh, this is a, 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 the voluntary system, there's some controversy about whether these need to be mandatory plans or not. And I just want to say, we have a voluntary system in New York. This is what's wrong with the New York State plan, actually. It's voluntary. The voluntary system is what we have now and it doesn't work. I spent, and lots of people have spent their careers trying to make this voluntary system work, and the result has been declining coverage, declining balances. Uh, I was, again, an Assistant Secretary of Labor overseeing. Uh, the private uh, retirement system overseeing ERISA. We have tried and tried to make this voluntary system work and we're, what we get is less coverage and less retirement uh, balances. So we know the problem, that hundreds of thousands of uh, New Yorkers could fall into poverty, millions don't have coverage, and we need the leadership uh, that you all are providing to move ahead to get New York State with these other progressive uh, locations to devise a plan that will meet legal tests, will meet legal standards, um, as, as one of my colleagues here said, will actually help small businesses. It'll take some administrative burden away from them and allow them to offer retirement plans to, or, or have their workers participate in retirement plans, which helps give them a competitive advantage in the labor market. So for all those reasons, uh, and more detailed in our testimony, uh, this is a great plan. I'm gonna, oh. uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Liz Epeles. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with, uh, thank you, council members. I have two concerns, I mean, and they're my concerns as a private citizen who has been a business owner and has paid into the system both privately. But as a city worker, I've had certain challenges and concerns that I'd like to express. One is um, I've asked to switch from one retirement system into the next. And it's only upon appeal, upon appeal, upon appeal, and prodding and telephone calls that I have been successful in doing so. I think this is really unfair. When I've requested, two is when I've requested to go into the board meetings to inquire in person as to why my money that's being managed is not in an open meeting as we have here in New York State and New York City, and Sunshine Laws do not apply. These are not executive session that are not all the meetings should be executive sessions. I have not been allowed upon, um, upon my requests through phone calls, 
um, letters and so forth. These are concerns that I need to express as a private citizen, and I think they should be addressed. And I'm hoping this is the forum to do so. Thank you very much for allowing me to express my concerns. Thank you very much. And I, I don't have a, a written testimony because that was, that was an interesting statement and we'd like to take all this into account as we move forward and build this program. Also, Ms. Manelli? Antonelli. Antonelli, I'm so sorry, I didn't have it. From, um, we don't have your, your written testimony. So we wanna make sure that we have that for the record as well. Okay. Okay. Councilman Kalos has, has also has some questions for the panel. I'm going to try to um, move along quickly. I first want to start by thanking uh, Angela Antonelli, uh, Executive Director at the Georgetown University Center for Retirement Initiatives, uh, first for coming all the way here, but also second for giving me access to the State Resource Center, which allowed me to prepare for today's hearing and all the questions I received from the uh, press court. Certainly an amazing resource that you've uh, put together here, and I thank John Adler for his uh, work with you. I was going to say thanks, John, for being one of the founders. <laughs> uh, and I just want to uh, s ask a question to the uh, uh, American Retirement Association. So, within the text of Intro 888, we do provide a fairly broad exemption relating to uh, retirement plans. Uh, I, I raised the issue of the Jarvis case. Uh, is there anything? Why do you believe that the existing language is not sufficient to exempt every plan, including those, incidentally, that would be ERISA? Please turn on the mic. Well, the eligible employee definition, if I remember, it starts at age 18, correct? And the requirements- I'm open to moving it to 21, but with regards to a specific exemption for ERISA plans that we're trying to steer away from federal preemption. I'm sorry, I don't, so what's, what's the uh, question, outstanding question right now then? Uh, we have a laundry list of retirement, definitions of retirement plan. Sure. We don't actually mention ERISA because of the federal preemption. Uh, is there a reason why the list that we currently don't, we currently have here is insufficient to satisfy your concerns and those of the other trade associates? I think an explicit carve out of ERISA plans is needed. Or federally preempted. Correct. Uh, <laughs> Are you saying you're federally preempted from doing so? Under the guidance provided in the Jarvis uh, statement of interest. So and this is the, the district court opinion? It's not an opinion. This is just what the uh, DOJ said. Uh, again, American Retirement Association didn't participate in that. Uh, no worries. Okay. And then uh, I just want to turn to uh, Rick. Uh, thank you for your service in the administration. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, the definition of voluntary is whether a person can opt in or opt out, and this is still a voluntary plan. It's just a question of whether or not the, it is an auto-enrollment or not. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. This is your, uh, the 1975 safe harbor provisions in ERISA are very clear about their four, you know them better than I do because you practice in this area, but the, there are standard safe harbor provisions in, uh, in ERISA that include uh, the employer makes no contributions, the employer participation is voluntary, and there are other ones as well. And I just want to note, I guess it was a little unclear, but what you were saying, that the Trump administration's intervention in Jarvis is trying to say that if you use the words ERISA in the bill, you then are automatically preempted. It's a, it's a, so to mention ERISA, they then want to claim that, that that somehow is involved, that makes it an ERISA plan. Right. I mean, so the Trump administration has a lot of anti-labor uh, and anti-worker provisions going. So that intervention in Jarvis, it hasn't been accepted by the court yet. But that's the, I, I understand your caution on this now, given the way the Trump Labor Department is approaching this. Uh, thank you all for testifying. Thank you all for your testimony. It will be added to the record. Thank you so much. Next panel, Beth Finkel and Sayel Gill.
Good afternoon. You may begin. Just uh, please identify yourself, speak into the mic. On? Ah, okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Chairperson Miller and members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. Uh, my name is Beth Finkel, and I am the State Director for AARP New York. And on behalf of our nearly three quarter of a million members in the five boroughs of New York City, I'm here to thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify, um, but also to make sure that if you didn't hear us loud and clear earlier today, uh, our members care very, very deeply about this issue. Uh, the legislation to establish a workplace retirement savings program in New York City is a very effective solution to help employees save for their retirement. Uh, today, uh, to get a, a secure retirement in New York State is very difficult. As a matter of fact, in New York State, there are 3.5 million people who go to work every day and can't save for retirement in the workplace. Because as we have stated previously, there le there's less defined benefit plans, companies are not offering 401ks, and so what is someone to do? And if money is not taken automatically out of your paycheck, um, people are less likely to save for their retirement. And if they are able to take the money automatically out of their paycheck, they are 15 times more likely to save for retirement. So I applaud you, um, Council Member Miller and uh, Council Member Kalos for taking up this legislation because it couldn't be any more essential, not just to the quality of life, but at the very essence of life for people as they age. In a 2015 ARP survey, New York City voters ages 35 to 69, many of them worried about their personal finances. And the two things that uh, we found in common with Gen Xers and Boomers, although they say they're not exactly alike, this they were alike about. They are so worried about being able to save their retirement. As a matter of fact, Three quarters, 78% of the Gen Xers said they were worried about being able to save for retirement. That's a really staggering statistic, I think. In um, 2017, AARP partnered with the Asian American Federation, the Hispanic Federation, the NAACP, and the Urban League because we knew that inherently there was an uneven playing field for the people of color in our community. And so um, we've all joined together to look at this, and the numbers are even more staggering when you look at exactly what it means to communities of color to be able to save. In fact, they have, uh, members of those communities have saved less than 50% of what white New Yorkers have been able to save. And they are so much more dependent on Social Security. As a matter of fact, Social Security benefits, you know, are tied to one's earnings. And because people of color generally earn less money throughout their lives, they end up with less Social Security. The average Social Security payment in New York State is around $16,000 a year. You can't support yourself in New York City on $16,000 dollars a year. And that's why empowering people to save for themselves is at the heart of this. Um, you know, this is not about saying to companies, you must do this for your workers. This is about empowering the workers themselves because in effect, companies are not going to be able to contribute to these plans that will not be allowed. So this is truly about empowering individuals to be able to save for themselves because as I said earlier, they're 15 times more likely to save for retirement if it's automatically taken out of their savings. Uh, I just want to reinforce the point I made earlier that people 50 plus contribute $70 billion to the economy of New York City every single year. That's called the longevity economy, and that is something that we need to enhance and keep supporting because, as I said before, they're not taking their money offshore. They're spending every single penny of their retirement back in the community, and that's what we need, and, and that's what they want. They want their own money to be able to spend 
locally, and we have to be respectful of people and make sure that that happens, both for the sake of good fiduciary responsibility on our parts as citizens and government, but also to empower individuals and allow them to age with dignity. So again, um, this proposal will ensure that it is mandatory for employers of a certain size and that it's opt out for employees, which is very key to its effectiveness. ARP would like to note that while we are testifying here today in support of both intro 888-A and 901-A, we strongly urge the council to update the language of 888-A to reflect that of the administration. In particular, AARP supports lowering the threshold to require employers with five or more employees to offer a workplace retirement savings account. Additionally, we would like to see the default employee contribution increased from three to five percent. So again, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for working on something that is so important to our whole society. We can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. My name is Sarah Mishevich Gill. Uh, I am with the ARP office in Washington, D.C. And in fact, I also sit on the Maryland Retirement Security Board. I'm the Program Design Committee Chair for them. And I've also sat on the Pennsylvania Task Force on Retirement Security, and they're working on passing similar legislation as we speak. So I've traveled through the country, and I have uh, worked with every state that has engaged on passing this legislation. And if you have questions about what's going on throughout the country, I'd be happy to answer them. I'd also like to say that I have a personal story about this. I actually come from a small business family. My grandfather owned a small business, my father owned a small business, and my mom was a teacher with a pension. So I got to see both sides of the coin. And I know that without that pension, my parents would not be afloat in retirement. And that's a sentiment I've heard throughout the country, in fact, about from states that have passed this bill. In fact, one of the first Illinois Secure Choice adopters was a restaurant. And to the earlier testimony, that just shocks me because what this line cook who was saving for retirement for the first time in his life said was, gosh, I thought saving for retirement was for lawyers and doctors. I did not know this was for me. And that was the first time he really had the ability to do this. And we have seen bill after bill on the federal level. In fact, in 2008, both President Obama and John McCain supported a federal version of the bill before you today. But nothing's happened. It's been more than a decade. So states and cities are stepping into that breach. And ARP is working with them throughout the country. In fact, we've worked with more than 40 states to either consider this legislation, pass it, or get it up and running. As you heard earlier, there's more than 10 states that are already getting this program up and running. And we're working strongly with each of them, not only to make sure that it's rolled out in a way that is effective and to make sure that it saves taxpayer dollars, but also to make sure that the education and outreach outreach component is there because as you've heard this is really important to make sure that both employees and employers know. The number one fact I think it's important to remember is that employees are always in the driver's seat. That means that they can choose how much money they want to put away, if they want to put money away at all, they can opt out at any time, and they can choose where they want to put it. Also importantly, employers are in the driver's seat here because they can choose whether or not they want to use this backup plug and play IRA that you're setting up. They don't have to run it. They don't have to pay for it. They can continue to focus on keeping their business open. And that's what we want them to do. We want them to be able to remain competitive with other states and localities in the area. If you look, New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, they're all considering this type of legislation. We want local businesses to stay competitive. And this is the best way that we know to do that to keep employers and employees in the driver's seat and to make the right way the easy way. Thank you. Thank you so much and, and thank you for AARP's not just support but their leadership on this effort. Obviously, we could not do it without you, but um, more importantly for recognizing um, the need and, and the critical point in this country's juncture that we find ourselves and and as I and we're preparing for the next one but I just uh, want to thank you for um, helping out this morning but a lot of the information that was provided and uh, I think one critical point that came out as we talk about um, uh, divine benefit pensions and 
are they enough? Are they, you know, with the rising cost of living that five years from now, the quality of life that you thought you were going to have is forcing you into seeking out other employment. And you shouldn't have to do that uh, in your retirement age. And so we're hoping that we can provide uh, this saving plan that will, will assist in that quality of life that so many Americans and so many New Yorkers so richly deserve. So thank you so much. And um, we, we have Oregon. Okay. Good morning. morning and I guess it is morning in Oregon right? and then thank is. you to uh, council member Kalos for the technology and thank you for um, for your expertise for sharing happy to so we wanted to uh, welcome you to the hearing uh, you we, we saved the best for last uh, we've been referring a lot to Oregon saves because you've been doing this for a number of years uh, and so you have about three minutes if you can uh, share whatever testimony you've prepared and we may have some questions. Sure, uh, happy to, uh, Councilmember Kellos. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Michael Parker, uh, Executive Director of the Oregon Savings uh, Network here at the Oregon State Treasury. Uh, the network really focuses on promoting the financial security of all Oregonians uh, and that includes retirement savings. Uh, in 2017, Oregon launched the first in the nation auto IRA for private sector workers. Uh, Oregon Saves was created in response to our state's and our nation's retirement savings crisis. Um, uh, it won't surprise you to hear some stats that more than half of the private sector workers in the United States uh, lack access to employer-sponsored retirement savings at work. In Oregon alone, with the working age population here of about 1.8 million, there's an estimated 1 million private sector workers without such access to save retirement at work. And the reason why it's so important to do it at your place of business is um, a research by the, the AARP shows that workers are 15 times more likely to save if there is an option to do so at their place of business. So I'm pleased to report that the program here in Oregon uh, works and has already achieved significant success in its initial rollout. I'll give you some statistics. Um, about 3,200 employers have started submitting payroll contributions for their employees. Uh, that equals about 50,000 accounts have been established for new savers. Uh, and that equals about 30 million uh, saved over just two years. And I'll remind you that we're not quite through our rollout. Uh, we still have the smallest employers uh, yet to go. Uh, our average monthly contribution is right around $126 per month. Uh, and total monthly contributions are nearly $4 million, and that's increasing uh, every month. Uh, and it's, uh, it's nice to see that our participation rate continues to hold steady at about 70%, uh, which was what was projected. Uh, participating workers contribute to their IRA with every paycheck, uh, and those IRAs are tied to the worker, uh, ensuring that the worker saves, the, the worker's uh, account is portable and will always remain under their control and workers can opt out if they want, uh, but most are staying in, about three of every four eligible workers. Uh, Oregon, saves is, Oregon Saves is adding approximately 1,000 savers every week. And we anticipate that volume to increase over the next few years as our smaller businesses join the program in the final waves of the rollout. Uh, the participation rate for eligible workers has remained steady, as I said, around 72%. And that is consistent with our market analysis that was completed back in 2016. Uh, one thing that I think is very important is we continually test uh, this program with the public. We want to make sure that we're doing what they need. We want to make sure that we're providing the support uh, and, the, and the proper options that the employers and the employees need. Um, and the public overwhelmingly supports Oregon Saves. Uh, employers say it's easy to sign up for workers, and based on a recent public survey that we conducted uh, with a professional uh, organization, the level of support has actually increased in the first year. 
Uh, that poll found that an, an, an astounding 82% of people support Oregon Saves. Uh, and I think that's an important number because we wanted to make sure that this program was you know, widely spread out and that people understood it. And I think that we've achieved that goal. Uh, and so really in conclusion, um, uh, the success of Oregon Saves uh, will have long-term posi positive implications for the savers and for Oregon. Um, obviously, the more people that save, uh, much like college savings and other savings that people do, will have a positive financial impact on the state as a whole. Um, and it has the ability to, uh, Oregon Saves has the ability uh, to save already improving the business climate here and already increasing the long-term financial stability of thousands of Oregonians. Uh, so I'll just say again in conclusion that this program has uh, gained momentum over the past two years. Again, we're not uh, quite finished with our rollout yet. And as you may know, Oregon is a small business state. So we're going to see a number of employers coming online with 10 employees and under. And that is really where we want to really hit our stride is working hard with those employers to make sure it's easier for them to set it up and that, the, that they have the support to, uh, to uh, make sure their employees save. So with that, um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that uh, anyone on the council has. Thank you so much again uh, for taking your time to uh, participate in this hearing. Um, it, it appears that the program, based on your, your, your study analysis and implementation, is kind of going according to what you had, what, what was projected or predicted. Um, but based on implementation and what you've seen thus far, are there any things that you are looking at to do differently, anything that you would have done differently, but more importantly from a city the size of New York and uh, given its uh, economy and, where, and what its work has looked like, do you have any suggestions for us? Uh, sure, council member. I mean, I think that's, that's something that we always try to figure out what we can do better. A couple of things come to mind immediately. Th there, there needs to be a major focus on employer outreach uh, because again, as, as I'm sure the city has, much like us, there's going to be a number of small businesses, you know, that have 10, 20 employees. And those, a lot of those uh, employers are, are going to need, you know, just a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, help getting, getting things moving. But once it's set up, it's very easy, easy for them. Um, I, I didn't mention this, but the, our largest participating uh, sector is the is the restaurant or food service sector, which I imagine would, would equate well with, with the city of, of New York. The second thing I would say that I wish we had a do done when we passed the law back in 2015 was had our compliance function built in. Um, we don't wanna be onerous on compliance, but again, this is a mandate by the state, and so employers are required to facilitate if they don't offer a product. And by not having compliance at the beginning, we sort of set up a culture of non-compliance instead of the other way around. So uh, I, I would say that's a big one. I, I, would, I would definitely try to put a compliance function in at the beginning just to make sure the culture is, hey, we have to comply, here are the rules, and, and, and that employers don't have to, employers can think to themselves, well, I don't have to do it because there isn't any penalty or, or a compliance function. Thank you. Councilman Michaelos. Uh, thank you for sharing the information regarding uh, folks in the restaurant industry. Uh, we've received a number of concerns relating to low wage workers. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of their participation rate? Does losing 3% or 5% out of their paycheck cause them to opt out of the program or are they still staying in the program? Uh, Council Member Callos, uh, essentially, uh, they are staying in the program as much as anyone else is up to that 70% participation rate. It won't surprise you that when we do surveys with folks who opt out, uh, no matter who it is, they say, well, I really can't afford it at this time. Um, and that's the beauty of the program is if someone doesn't want to be in, they can opt out. But we're seeing a steady 70% participation rate. And most of those workers are 18, 18 to 35 they are first-time savers, and they're likely making minimum wage or a little more. So they are lower-income workers, and they see the value of retirement just like anybody else does. 
are workers who are contributing to their retirement seeing their debt go up or trouble with mortgage payments? Uh, are, there, are, are there any uh, effects that were unintended that you're seeing? Uh, council member, we're, we're not seeing that. Um, that's an interesting point because there are, uh, you can imagine there's a number of researchers out there from you know Duke to Pew uh, to University of Oregon that want to study some of those issues but we aren't, we aren't seeing that anecdotally. We're not seeing that uh, when we do the surveys. All people are saying essentially when they opt out is, well, right now I just can't afford the extra money. They, they don't necessarily disagree with the program. It's just at that point in time, they need the extra 5% in their, in their paycheck. The other thing we're seeing is um, instead of someone opting out, they may decide to say, well, I'm gonna just do 2% or 3% instead of the, of the, the default 5%. So, Anecdotally, we're not seeing any of those issues around debt, an increased debt or uh, increased uh, mortgage problems. We received questions about uh, private sector and the impact on specifically 401k providers and financial providers. Have you seen a situation where folks are choosing you over the private sector or where there's been any impact on 401k providers and financial service providers who are doing this privately? Uh, uh, Councilmember Callos, no, because we don't offer a 401k, we offer an IRA, it's a Roth IRA. Uh, so uh, essentially we are trying to capture part of the market that was essentially being underserved or not served at all. Uh, so we're, we're not offering that 401k product where the employer will contribute. The employer here just facilitates uh, the movement of the money for us. And, and that section of the market was not being served, and, and so we're not seeing any competition there. What is the cost to the state of Oregon, and have you achieved self-sufficiency? Uh, we have achieved self-sufficiency. Uh, the, the, the state legislature here uh, loaned the, the program about $5 million over a period of four years uh, over two biennia. Uh, after those, and the two biennia is now up, uh, we just started our new biennia on July 1st of this year, and we are self-sufficient, so we are paying our bills, and, and, uh, and we're not taking any more money from, uh, from the state. My last question is, we did have a representative from small businesses uh, express concern about the, the administrative burden. Uh, in your experience, what's the administrative burden of enrolling employees in the auto, uh, the auto IRA payroll deduction versus administering their own plan? We're, council member, we're finding that, that once an employer, it takes maybe 45 minutes to an hour to get set up, to upload your employees and get the whole process set up for an employer. And then every pay period we're finding on average as we, as we survey our employers that are in the program, it's an extra 10 minutes or so, maybe a little less depending on, on what software they use to administer the program. And, and the one thing that, that the industry, so if you look at Oregon, California, Illinois, some of the other states that are looking at this, we are working directly right now with a number of payroll providers to really try to take the employer out of it. So uh, not to get into technical details because I'm not a technical person, but essentially we want to create a direct connection between our provider, our program provider, our administrator, and the payroll providers that are providing services to the employers and, and have them just do the, 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 the process like they would with any other payroll process. So it takes the employer all the way out of it. That, that's, that we believe that will happen in the next couple of years and so in the meantime, we're working to try to eliminate any administrative, uh, extra administrative burden that employers may have in the form of, of special templates and, and actually sit down with them and, and, and help them through the process. So it, we don't believe it's onerous at all. Uh, it's a matter of just you know, uh, getting used to a new process. It takes about 10 minutes uh, every pay period. Thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for sharing your experiences. And, uh, and, and I'm sure we will be calling on you again in the future. I am happy to help. Thank you for the invitation. And, and good luck with your, implementing your program. I appreciate the, the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank so you. Um, with that, we've heard all the panels. But I especially want to thank my colleague, uh, Kalos, for the not just the introduction of 888, but his 
his uh, the work that he's done over the past few years in bringing this um, legislation and and uh, to fruition. We are not there. We have some work to do, but just based on the number of experts that have given of their time and who are here to testify today, I know that we are uh, in good hands and that uh, working families and those who are looking towards retirement that there is a plan to assist them in in that. So I. Um, once again, thank everybody for coming out. Thank you for your testimony, those who participated in any shape, form, or fashion to uplifting um, our retire, um, community, retirement community. I thank you, and this hearing is adjourned. NYC TV test, check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, check one, two, NYC TV test, check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.